Thank you. And I think we want to turn this off so we don't have feedback. So thank you for having me. How many of you are here to see me for the first time? Never heard me speak before. Wow, that's terrific. How many of you watch me on YouTube? And Wonderful. All right. So I put out a lot of free content on YouTube and through a newsletter. And you can sign up for my YouTube channel and newsletter. I brought some sheets if you're not currently a subscriber. And you can get a college education in a few minutes a day, three days a week through those vehicles, right? Is there feedback? Yeah. yeah. So we have to fix that, I think, because I'll go out of my mind if we last this way for two hours. But I'm assuming they're doing something about that in the back. All right, so, <laughs> so anyway, um, one thing I want to say, and my talk is sort of geared in this direction, is my company specializes in something called informed medical decision making. How many of you know what that really means? Anybody? Let me explain it to you from our perspective, my perspective. Um, I want you to think about the way that you buy cars, houses, college educations for your kids, blenders, washing machines, and retirement accounts. How many of you bought at least some of those things? And keep your hand up if you're not an expert in the things that you bought. OK, so I'm not a real estate agent, but I've managed to buy houses and live in them for a long time. How did I do that? By asking questions, doing my own research, looking carefully, deliberating about what I was going to do, and then making the best decision that I thought I could make at the time. How many of you have been through that similar process? Okay. Has anybody bought a house this way? You get in the car with a real estate agent and you say, listen, I'm looking for a real estate guru. I'm too stupid to understand real estate, so just tell me where you want me to live. Anybody ever bought a house that way? Probably not. And in my entire time on this earth, I've never said to somebody, boy, what a nice car you have. And they said, well, personally, I don't like it, but it's the one the car salesman said I had to buy. All right? I've never heard that statement before. But here's what's ha what happens, and this is why it's so important to talk about this. When people show up in a doctor's office or they're talking to their neighbor about how to eat, they go brain dead on the buying skills. Have you ever noticed this? I'll ask people, why don't you end up doing a ketogenic diet? And they'll say, my neighbor told me. OK. And why are you taking this supplement? Oh, my cousin sells it. All right, that's a good reason. All right. and, and why did you decide to have this test or this drug, take this drug, whatever? Well, my doctor told me to do it. And so if we could teach people, if we could teach everybody, if I could wave a magic wand, this is what I would do, to practice informed decision making the way that we buy houses and cars and blenders and washing machines, if we would buy health care that way, the bill would be cut to one third of what it is today. And the health care system as we know it would be gone. It couldn't exist anymore. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Yeah. And then I would no longer spend every afternoon in my office hearing a statement that just makes my heart hurt. And it goes something like this. Well, if I'd known then what I know now, I never would have done. I wouldn't have eaten a keto diet. I wouldn't have taken this supplement. I wouldn't have blown out my kidneys. I wouldn't have agreed to this procedure. And I certainly wouldn't have had this test. So I guess what you could say is what we're promoting is no regret medicine where you, make the, you do the deliberating before rather than after. And that's essentially what we do. So I picked this topic when I was talking to Steve last year about this conference. I try to pick topics other people aren't talking about and that I think have widespread appeal. Now, obviously, when we're talking about sports nutrition, I'm assuming that you're not here because you're going to try to get into the Olympic trials this year, right? That's not why you all came. Why is this topic important? It's because everybody who's here has a child or a grandchild or a brother or somebody in your life who's working out at a gym or playing high school football and being told to eat a high protein diet, right? Uh, or being told to take supplements or that everybody needs to drink sports drinks. And, and as much confusion as there is about diet just in the general public, I think it's on steroids with sports nutrition. So I termed it sports, sports and exercise nutrition because we want to appeal to everybody, including people who are just trying to get the most out of their workouts. Ah, it worked, great. All right, so um, I'll just give you some background. I, I love medical history. And one of the reasons is because it informs us as to what some of the issues are that we've never resolved and that sort of thing. So I like to talk about medical history. So by way of background, um, optimal nutrition is something that's been talked about since back in the days of Hippocrates, believe it or not. Um, from the time of the ancient Olympics, there was discussion about the right diet. And some of the things that they were writing about back then, and you can see the early seeds of confusion. So we've got people saying, 
The secret to athletic performance is animal foods. So you want to eat a lot of oxen, goat, bull, and deer. No, it's not that. It's moist cheeses and wheat and dried figs. No, it's really liquor and special potions. I've always wanted to see the people who are doing Olympic events on alcohol. That would be sort of interesting to see. But um, if you look at the, some of the um, articles that were written at the time of the Berlin Olympics in 1938, you see that not much has changed since 776 BC. You see the same thing going on. So here are some of the quotes that, were, uh, that I took from news articles uh, that were written about the athletes in Berlin. So you hear the Olympic athletes competing in Berlin frequently focused on meat. Athletes regularly dined on two steaks per meal, sometimes poultry, averaged nearly a half a kilogram of meat daily. Pre-event meals consisted of one to three steak and eggs supplemented with meat juice extract. And then other athletes were stressing the importance of carbohydrate. The Olympic athletes from countries like England, Finland, and Holland were consuming porridge, and the athletes from Chile and, and Italy were feasting on pasta, and then the members of the Japanese team consumed one pound of rice daily. And so no change between 776 BC and 1938, and no change between 1938 and right now, right? So the same thing keeps going on. So for a very long time, athletes and coaches and people involved in the sports industry have been searching for the holy grail, the thing that makes the difference. And I think it's a lot of things that make a difference. It's not a single thing. The problem is that if you go back to 776 BC or you're talking about 2008, no, 2019 right now, we see the same phenomenon, which is that the, the decisions that athletes and their coaches are making about what to eat are not really guided by evidence. And that's a truly unfortunate thing. You see a lot of storytelling. You see a lot of testimonials and advertising and, and that sort of thing. And, and often bad practices being passed down through generations of athletes, like people who played football and, and ate a terrible diet or teaching other people who play football how to play football and eat a terrible diet. So we have everything going on but an analysis of the evidence. And um, one thing I'll tell you in analyzing the evidence, and this is just kind of a funny aside, I teach a course on sports nutrition through our school, and I taught it last year for the first time uh, in January. It's a 12-week course, and uh, by the way, that's part of my problem, is trying to take 24 hours of lecture and fit it into this format to give you an overview. But it was 24 hours of lecture and 24 hours of paper writing and research, and here's what we all concluded at the end. And I had some of my best students in this class. Athletes sometimes are so genetically gifted that they succeed in spite of the protein loading and the supplement taking and all the bad things they do to themselves. And really, the only thing that you can do other than eat well and train like crazy and hydrate, those are the big things, and we'll talk about those today, the things that really make a difference beyond that are all illegal. So you really, and, and the illegal stuff works great. I have to tell you, we did a lot of research on that. And if you're willing to do illegal things to promote sports performance, that's really where you get the most action. But if you're not going to do that, and you're going to play it straight. It is the food. It is the water. It is the exercise. All right. So I taught, called this sports and exercise nutrition because, as I mentioned earlier, I think we want to appeal to people who are just working out for fitness. And that's most of us in this room. I'm 62 years old, and I don't expect to be recruited for a professional sports team. What I do expect to do is live to be 100 and some, in good shape, and have a great quality of life, and be able to do anything I want to do. I have an 89-year-old father who doesn't take any drugs, and you know, lives on his own, and can do anything he wants to do at the age of 89. So I want to have that, but I want to go beyond that. I, I found out, by the way, there's a guy in Chile who's claiming to be 137 years old, and I'm hoping they can verify it, because there weren't any birth certificates back in, when he was born. But if they can, that means I have like 75 more years, and wouldn't that be cool? Think how much trouble I can get into, and how many people I can make angry with 75 more years of this, right? So let's talk about the best diet for athletes. There are three macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and the first business, of, or the first part of the misunderstanding is everybody thinks that protein is so important. It's the most important macronutrient. I'm going to show you and prove to you that it's not. But if you ask a coach or an athlete who's never been to a conference like this and goes to regular sports doctors and that sort of thing, they all say protein is the thing. Now, protein is important. It's important for everybody, including athletes. But the problem is that eating too much protein is dangerous and detrimental to your health. 
And that includes athletes as well. It's not limited to just um, the regular population. So what do athletes and everybody in this room, for, for that matter, use for energy? Well, carbohydrate is the preferred source of energy, particularly during exercise. Humans are more efficient at converting carbohydrate to energy than anything else they can eat. The energy comes from two sources, plasma glucose, which is the breakdown product of carbohydrate, and glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose. The best carbohydrate foods to eat are starchy foods. Fruits and vegetables are good for you. You should eat a lot of them. The problem is that the calorie density is not enough to meet people's needs, whether you're exercising or not, by the way, because at 100 calories a pound for vegetables and 200 calories a pound for fruit, we'd all have to quit our jobs and stay home and eat full time if we were going to meet our calorie needs just from fruits and vegetables. So starchy foods like potatoes and, and um, uh, squash and rice and beans, those are all a very important part of uh, the type of diet that people thrive on. And uh, people actually like those foods. It's interesting, I've had people jump up out of the chair and hug me, like I can have a potato. I've fantasized about potatoes for years while everybody told me not to eat them. I'm gonna go home and have one right now. So giving permission to eat potatoes is one of the great pleasures of my life in my office. Um, you probably have heard of hitting, hitting the wall. Hitting the wall, how that works is this is when an athlete is running a marathon or doing something else that requires a lot of stamina and just runs out of fuel. And your, your, your performance becomes impaired, everything goes south. Sometimes it means you drop out of the competition or you can't play or you can't run. And this is because you've run out of ready glucose and you've used up your glycogen storage. You don't want that to happen. So taking in enough carbohydrate is important. And if you do it, here are the benefits. First of all, you have enough energy to meet your calorie needs, exercising or not. The second thing is you maintain glucose levels during training and competition. You preserve your glycogen stores. You promote more rapid recovery after exercise. You preserve the body's lean muscle mass. That's very important. The irony of the protein loading is in the process of protein loading to become big and muscular, athletes end up losing muscle mass because they don't have enough fuel and the body will take fuel from uh, the lean mass. The storage form of glucose, by the way, is glycogen. And humans can store about 350 grams of carbohydrate, 1,400 calories in the form of muscle glycogen, and another 360 calories worth in the liver. There's a little bit circulating in the bloodstream. The larger the muscle mass, the bigger the athlete gets, the more glycogen he can store. But also, the bigger the athlete gets and the more muscle development, the more energy needed. So they kind of end up even, even though they can store more glycogen. Now, an interesting thing, and we're going to talk about hydration today, is in order to store glycogen, you have to be well hydrated. So you have to drink enough water. So for every gram of glycogen that you store, you take in three grams of water. And this is one of the things that can really help an endurance athlete, like if you're running a marathon. Anybody in here run marathons? I've done a few. So what, that will sustain you longer. So the well hydrated um, athlete who's stored a lot of glycogen will last a lot longer in an endurance race than the poorly hydrated or dehydrated athlete will. Um, glucose is the main ingredient to create ATP, which is the energy source that provides energy to the cells. Now tissues have limited storage capacity for ATP because it burns, it burns hot. So if you could store a lot of this stuff, you'd just catch fire and die. It doesn't work that way. So you have to constantly produce it. And that's why you need a steady source of glucose entering the bloodstream. And the glucose comes from carbohydrate. That's, what, that's the only way you're going to get ready glucose is by eating carbohydrate. Glycolysis is the process by, why, by which ATP is produced through the conversion of glycogen back to glucose. Aerobic glycolysis is in the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic glycolysis is not with oxygen, it's without oxygen. Aerobic glycolysis produces more fuel than anaerobic glycolysis and also does so without producing lactic acid. So when, you're, when we're talking about anaerobic exercise, we're talking about short sprints, we're talking about jumps, uh, throwing something, shot put, that sort of thing. You can only do it for about a minute and a half or two minutes, and the reason is the lactic acid build up in the muscle. And here's something interesting, and it goes to the hydration issue that I'm going to mention a lot of times during this talk. And that is that when you are well hydrated, you're dumping lactic acid into a larger pool of fluid because a significant percentage of your pl blood plasma is made of water. Dehydrated athletes run the risk of metabolic acidosis much more 
than hydrated athletes because of the, the uh, smaller liquid volume of the blood. So another, advert, another reason to promote drinking a lot of water. Now, the body has a lot of ways to meet um, energy needs. And if you refuse to eat enough carbohydrate, and you insist on eating a paleo diet, and you insist on eating a lot of protein, the body will just do compensatory things in order to keep your body operating. That doesn't always result in health, but the human will always be operating no matter what adjustments have to be made. So gluconeogenesis is the process of making glucose from a non-carbohydrate substance. It's an adaptive mechanism to make sure that you don't hit the wall when you're just walking around every day, let alone um, doing an exercise event. Low carbohydrate diets will, will deplete plasma glucose and eventually dry up your glycogen stores. So this forces the body to convert triglycerides and amino acids to a carbohydrate glucose type substance for fuel. Um, and also can involve breaking down lean muscle mass for fuel. So again, the protein loading athlete is doing so in the interest of building strong muscles. And while he's protein loading and not eating enough carbohydrate, his body is borrowing amino acids from his muscle stores in order to fuel the body. Doesn't that sound like a counterproductive strategy, right? Okay. And by the way, and we'll talk about this several times, this also increases the solute load on the kidneys because when you metabolize protein, lots of waste product that has to be de uh, detoxified and your kidneys get charged with doing that. All right, so let's talk about fat because keto diets are in fashion right now and people are even promoting keto diets for athletes, which is the worst idea I've ever heard. Um, prolonged exercise can, can result in the body using fat for fuel, but not dietary fat for fuel. What happens is the body starts accessing stored fat for fuel, which is a good thing, particularly if you're trying to lose weight. The amount, the amount of fat stored in an average person it can fuel a 950 mile run or 120 hours of intense exercise. I don't recommend that, by the way, but if you were to not eat anything in exercise, you actually could draw a lot from your fat stores. Now, the amount of glucose that you can store, and this is why you need a steady source of it, can fuel a 20 mile run and 1.6 hours of intense exercise. The leanest, healthiest athletes have between 50 and 100,000 calories worth of fat stored. So what happens is, when you do lower intensity exercise, let's say when I run out the front door and I'm gonna go run for 45 minutes just for fitness, that I like running and it's one of the things that I do. What happens is I start burning fat after a little while for energy because I'll run out of glucose in the bloodstream, all right? As the intensity increases, the proportion of energy that's coming from the stored fat decreases and the, what's needed from glucose increases. Progressive endurance training um, increases the size and number of the mitochondria so you become more efficient at burning fat. So this goes to well, the reason why some people exercise is to lose fat and to gain muscle and to live a long life, that's me. So the more I run, the more efficient I get at using stored fat for fuel, which means that I don't really have to worry about a net fat gain as long as I eat well and I exercise. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's a reason to stay with exercise because the more of it you do, the more beneficial it becomes because your body acclimates to it and becomes much more efficient. And, and on a very small level, that's what professional athletes do. They work out and work out and work out so that their body becomes better at doing all of the things that are involved in sports. However, fat oxidation is not enough to reduce the amount of carbohydrate you need from fuel. Um, increasing the ability to metabolize fat should not be a sign that athletes should start eating more fat. One of the problems, by the way, with eating a lot of fat is a lot of times the fat that people are eating comes with um, uh, protein, animal protein. And um, another problem is that athletes sometimes get this feeling of almost omnipotence, like I'm in such great shape on the outside and I have such high aerobic intensity or um, capability that maybe I don't have to worry about health like other people. And they're not, they're not um, inoculated against the bad effects of bad eating. So one example is Alberto Salazar. I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but he's a former Olympic marathon runner, represented the United States uh, on a number of occasions. He's also one of the best Olympic uh, running training coaches in the country. And a few years ago, he suffered from a massive heart attack. So here was a guy who looked great on the outside. If you look at pictures of him the day before he had his heart attack, you think, wow, what an athlete. And he was. And he was training athletes, knew a lot about training people. So he had a massive heart attack. Why? 
because he was protein and fat loading instead of eating a high carbohydrate diet. Some of you who know the story of Bob Harper, same thing, looked great on the outside, promoting fitness, had a heart attack, and then instead of promoting plant-based nutrition, he's on the payroll for the drug companies, which is truly depressing, but have you guys seen his ad? He's promoting a, I think it's a cholesterol-lowering drug or something like that, or a blood thinner. But uh, anyway, he didn't, le he didn't learn. He did, the, he did a three-week uh, vegan diet and then went back to eating protein and fat, which is really unfortunate. And now hasn't apparently learned much from this latest episode of a heart attack. But, but the whole point that I'm making is that you're not exempt from what happens to people as a result of poor dietary choices just because you're fit, just because you're muscular. And we have to keep that in mind. So increasing fat intake does not improve your athletic performance. All right, so let's talk about this protein issue. I want, to, I want to show you the mechanism by which your body will just start breaking down its own lean mass if it has to to survive. So just some basics of protein. So anabolism is a state in which the body builds new tissue, and it does it every day. Your whole body remodels itself every so often. I mean, you get a whole new skeleton every year. Um, everything is regenerating. It slows down, the regeneration pace slows down, which is why we don't live forever, but we do regenerate. Catabolism is a, is a state in which tissues are broken down and, and amino acids are used for fuel. Proteins are broken down into amino acids which contribute to the amino acid pool. And one thing I want to explain that will probably help more than anything to under, understand this protein and carbohydrate issue is the difference in the way that the body metabolizes protein versus carbohydrate. So I teach by analogy, so here's a good one that people readily understand. So um, glucose is to the body, which comes from carbohydrate, like gas is to the car. You fill the tank with gas, you drive for a while, the tank is empty, you have to go get more. We all do that, right? There's, there's no other fuel for the car. All right, then I want you to picture for a minute a fountain in downtown Columbus, where I live, that has 500 gallons of water in it. Do we put 500 new gallons in every day? No, we just replace what splashed out or evaporated, so maybe 20 new gallons of water. That's the way protein works, because protein's broken down into peptides and polypeptides and amino acids, and then those amino acids are joined together to make um, enzymes and hormones and various things that the body needs to function. And then when that enzyme is used, the amino acids break apart and they go back into the pool and they're reconfigured again. And they can be used so many times before they're torched and you can't use them again. So protein is to the body like the water in the fountain is in downtown Columbus. You only have to replace what gets torched, what evaporates or splashes out. All right, so that's, and, and the other thing too, is digestion is a deconstruction process where you, you have the food breaking down, the protein is converted to, or broken down into amino acids. So people who talk about you have to eat complete proteins and all that sort of thing, you don't, you don't have to do that at all because it all goes into the pool and it's being broken down as it goes through the body. So once, once it gets to the, to the amino acid pool, then various combinations of, of, pro, of amino acids are put together in order to make things that the body needs for function, just to put it in very simple terms. All right, does everybody understand that? The difference between glucose and, pro, and, um, and protein byproduct. Okay, so most athletes are consuming more protein that they, than they need, and unless they're eating themselves into obesity, the protein is displacing some of the carbohydrate. And power athletes do more of it. They'll eat even more protein and they'll even take supplemental protein in the form of drinks and supplements and that sort of thing, which makes things even worse. Now protein is important for making muscle. It is, your body uses it for that, and hormones and enzymes. But high protein intake will result in your body having to burn some for fuel and first of all, it means that there may not be enough protein for other functions. So your body is basically saying, listen, we really would like to make some enzymes and hormones, or we'd like to replace some muscle tissue, but we can't do that. We're going to have to use the amino acids for fuel. The other thing that it can result in is going after amino acids that readily convert to fuel in the, in the muscle mass to fuel the body with energy. And once again, can't emphasize this too much, your kidneys get um, charged with discharging the waste product um, that comes from nitrogen, which is released when the amino acid chains are broken down, and that can really cause kidney damage over a long period of time. Um, and one thing I'll mention too is if people are getting their protein from food, it's almost always accompanied by higher fat intake, which is a risk for coronary artery disease, which I mentioned before. So nitrogen balance 
is a way to measure protein, uh, how your body's using protein. So um, positive nitrogen balance means that nitrogen intake is, is um, exceeding nitrogen excretion. So that means that your body has additional protein left over, amino acids left over, to build stuff, hormones and enzymes. You want to be slightly positive, all right? Negative nitrogen um, balance means you're excreting more than you're taking in. So where is the excess nitrogen coming from? It's coming from breaking down muscle mass. To grab amino acids, one of them is alanine, converts really well to glucose. Very counterproductive for athletes. So you can measure urinary nitrogen excretion. That's how we know how much protein humans need. It's actually really small because of the fact that the, protein, the amino acids are recirculated like the, fountain, like the water in the fountain in downtown Columbus. All right? So that's why your protein needs are so low. So we can measure that. So what this means is if you have a um, negative nitrogen balance, that means that your body is using protein for fuel, muscle, muscle mass. So dietary carbohydrate back to eating potatoes and squashes and rice and beans will solve that. And um, starvation diets, the, the people who are at risk of burning up their own lean muscle mass in order to fuel their bodies are people who starve themselves, so people with eating disorders, um, people who restrict carbohydrate diet, uh, carbohydrate intake, think, think uh, paleo or keto, and, um, uh, and people whose uh, energy needs are less than, or more than their energy intake. A common misunderstanding is that protein itself will build muscle. Do you guys find that kind of interesting? Like you could sit on the couch and eat protein and you would become a muscular person. Well, if that were true, we would live in a country full of Arnold Schwarzeneggers because the protein eating sitting habits of Americans are very well known. And you can look around and see that we are not building strong muscular bodies sitting and eating protein. You have to do resistance training. Athletic training, and I'll show you, some, there are many studies out there that actually show this, that you can feed people a diet with 17% protein and 34% protein, and if the exercise schedule is the same, there's no difference in their muscle mass at the end of a period of time, 12, 16 weeks. Why is that? It's because it's the exercise that's doing it. What athletes need is more calories, okay? And, and what happens, if we, I call it error of attribution. Here's how the protein myth gets perpetuated. So a kid starts playing football in ninth grade and his calorie needs goes, go up and he's losing weight and he doesn't have much energy and his coach says, you need to eat more protein and drink Gatorade. So he does and he does better. And he says, ah, protein and Gatorade rock. Okay, if he were eating rice and beans, 500 extra calories a day and drinking water, 64 ounces a day, he would say, rice and beans rock. And so does water, because what he needed was the calories. He attributed the benefit to the protein. So if athletes get enough calories, they don't need more protein. And, um, and athletes who report that they're bigger and stronger, it's because of that error of attribution. So during exercise, you will have some protein and muscle breakdown uh, during intense physical exercise and, and uh, resistance training when you eat a low carbohydrate diet or an adequate calorie uh, carbohydrate diet. Um, research shows, however, that the maximum utilization, rate of utilization for protein for non-energy use is one and a half grams per kilogram of body weight. If more is consumed, in other words, if you consume more protein than you need, then your body has to do one of two things, excrete it, now we're gonna blow out your kidneys, or store it as fat. That's right, your body can store extra protein intake as fat. You don't store protein anyplace. You have an amino acid pool, when it's full, you're either gonna excrete the protein or you're going to store it as fat. Most people don't know that. So what does this translate to? 15% of calories at the upper end is what athletes need. More calories, more protein, same percentage, 15% of calories from protein. Studies show that athletes don't consume enough calories. I mean, we have research showing this. It's not me just talking about the ninth grade football player. We have research showing that athletes just plain don't consume enough calories. Um, and, and the other thing I'll mention is if we can get everybody to start eating more carbohydrate instead of protein, it's better for the animals, it's better for everything that way. It's also better for the kidneys. Clean, a carbohydrate is much cleaner fuel than protein. And, and that's important to remember. 
The Institute of Medicine, in fact, says no additional dietary protein is suggested for healthy adults undertaking resistance or endurance exercise. Now, the timing of protein is important, and I am going to spend just a couple of minutes and a few minutes on the timing of meals. Um, and this surprises a lot of people. You utilize protein and other nutrients best if you eat several times throughout the day. And I'll show you some data on that. When protein intake is adequate, by the way, you don't need to worry about consuming it from animals, a vegetarian or a vegan athlete who gets enough calories, enough protein, ends up in great shape. Okay, so here's a good example, and I picked the study for a reason, I'll show you on the next slide, of what this protein issue looks like. So in this study, male endurance athletes were placed on three diets. And what they did, each athlete ate a diet for three weeks. There was a two-week washout period, then they were put on the next one, two-week washout, and then on the next one. So they all got to eat all three diets. And here's basically what happened. So the protein ranged from 7% to 26%. That's a pretty wide range, wouldn't you say? All right, higher protein in intake resulted in the highest rate of muscle breakdown. The more protein they ate, the more muscle they broke down. Lower protein intake resulted in better protein utilization. The researchers further noticed, noted, there was no advantage to consuming protein higher than 1.8 kilograms per kilogram of body weight. So those people consuming 26% of calories from protein did not have an advantage, they had a disadvantage. The protein intake needed to achieve zero nitrogen balance, only 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram, even lower. Protein intake of over 1.8 grams, carbohydrate intake would be too low to maintain muscle glycogen stores and hydration. Eating a high protein diet washes out your, your water stores. And one of the reasons is because water is stored with glycogen. You stop eating carbohydrate, your body uses up ready glucose, burns up the stored glycogen, out comes the, the water that's been stored and the athlete's in a perpetually dehydrated state. And the reason I chose this study is it was funded by the National Beef Cattlemen's Association. Now these people want you to eat meat. And they conducted a study showing that you should not eat meat. I can't overemphasize the importance of this. These are people who have a horse in the race and they're telling you, don't do it, right? Very important. One other thing I'll mention is protein foods, high protein foods have a long, um, the longest gastric emptying time. So they make it, it's very difficult to eat a high protein diet and live on that and exercise and compete and that sort of thing. Because if you, has anybody ever eaten too much before exercising or you didn't wait long enough? It's some of the most uncomfortable feeling you'll ever have. You certainly don't want to be entering a race for money when you're in that state, right? So when you eat carbohydrate food, it goes through the system quickly, gets absorbed, and can be used for fuel. It's a much better source of, prote of uh, energy than protein food is. Um, and there's no evidence, by the way, that adding protein to sports drinks improves performance either. I mean, any place you put the protein, in the beef, in the sports drink, doesn't matter. In the whey protein, it doesn't matter. It does not improve uh, performance. So if you're going to build muscle, which is what a lot of athletes are trying to do and their justification for eating a high protein diet, here's what you have to do. The first thing is resistance training. You know, the hardest thing I have to get people to do is to exercise. I've never seen anything like the, ex the excuses people have for not exercising. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the best one is I don't have any time. Everybody, okay? Well, I've, I've just, I guess I was going to wait till I was 70 years old to become a curmudgeon. We just never got that far. I said, I often say to people, well, the reason why I can exercise all the time is because I have nothing to do. I sit around on the couch eating bonbons most days and exercise is a welcome intrusion on the sitting. And of course, they, and people say, you're so funny, Dr. Pam. I, go, I know, I'm a riot. But you've got to get in the gym. You just have to exercise. And you're never going to be fit. And whether you're, you're interested in exercise for sport or competition or just staying fit, I'll tell you this too. The key to staying independent, independent living for the rest of your life is exercise. The number one reason people enter a nursing home is they're frail. And how you avoid frailty is you start exercising and building a strong body right now. And so you see all these people living to be 100 years old on their own. It's because they can go up and down the stairs and bend over and tie their shoes and reach up in the cupboard and put things away and go get food. You can't do that when you're frail. So yeah, I can't help but the advertisement for exercise. Got to do it. Um, you have to have continued calorie and carbohydrate intake, adequate levels of both. Um, distribution of protein throughout the day. We're going to talk about meal timing in a minute here. And then consumption of carbohydrate after exercise. 
because the first thing your body wants to do is replace those glycogen stores, and it can't do it with protein and fat. Um, have to talk about whey protein, because um, people, it's amazing how many athletes use it. So whey protein is one of the two major milk proteins, and the benefit of it is supposed to be it has a very high concentration of branched-chain amino acids, which are good for muscle, muscle building. Well, you can see on this slide, soy has just as much branched-chain amino acids. If you're going to load with protein, soy works just as well. I don't think you should load with either of them, but I'm just saying you do not need to consume dairy protein in order to do this. Whey protein powder has 11 to 15% protein. Soy powder, actually more at 50, uh, at 50%. Soy protein concentrate and soy protein isolate are pretty equal to whey. So there is no superiority of whey protein over soy and no reason to, if you're going to have something with protein in it, it certainly can be soy. All right, let's go on to another topic, and I'll take some questions at the end. I think you probably will have some, but um, timing of meals is very important. Food intake for athletes is generally not well-timed. A lot of times they try to squeeze all the meals, all the calories into two meals or three meals a day. Um, both anaerobic and aerobic elite athletes suffer from this uh, uh, performance-wise. And a lot of times, athletes will take supplements because they say, I don't have enough time to eat as much food as I need to eat, so I'll just take supplements, and that never works out as well as food. So here's the mechanism of action and how this works. Athletes often operate under a calorie deficit during the day because they skip meals or wait too long to eat. Blood glucose levels drop. Amino acids are recruited, particularly alanine, from the muscle tissue or from dietary protein that's left over um, and used for fuel. Um, this stabilizes blood sugar, but at the expense of muscle mass and body composition. And um, by the way, low blood sugar and hyperinsulinemia facilitate the storage of fat. Again, it's counterproductive to what an athlete is trying to do. The more frequent the eating pattern, the more muscle mass can be built and maintained. And because athletes need more calories, it's easier to get them to a calorically adequate state if they're eating more frequently rather than trying to eat an increasing amount of food at a setting. And by the way, we see the same thing with people who have other types of illnesses. Last year when I was here, I did a talk on inflammatory bowel disease. And a lot of times these people are needing enough food because they're sick and they don't like eating. And so it's much easier to get their caloric adequacy up by eating five or six times a day than it is to try to get them to eat more at one sitting. So whether you're an athlete or you're sick, it's easier to take in enough calories if you eat frequently. Failure to eat frequently results in many starvation periods throughout the day. This lowers the basal metabolic rate. It can average in 620 fewer calories burned per day eventually. And this is what you have to be careful of. We're somewhat uh, victims of our evolutionary history, and humans have learned to live without fuel for long periods of time. That's how we survived as a species. So when you don't eat enough food, you don't have to do that for very long, or if food seems like the, the food is um, unpredictable. Your body has this marvelous mechanism which slows down metabolism and allows you to survive with decreasing amounts of food. I've seen people who can gain weight on 700 calories a day. And it's easier for women. Women do it much more efficiently than men, and the reason is the, the metabolic demands of carrying children and breastfeeding under adverse circumstances make women better at slowing down. Jewish women who entered the Warsaw Ghetto during uh, to, um, World War II, who were pregnant at the time they went into the ghetto, they delivered full-term, healthy, normal-weight infants on 450 calories a day. That is the extent to which a human being can slow down metabolism if needed because of calorie inadequacy and or long periods of time, unpredictable uh, timing of meals. So if you lower your metabolic rate, you're going to have increased fat mass, and it makes it more difficult to eat without gaining weight, counterproductive for anybody, particularly an athlete. So let me show you some research on this, because sometimes people just don't believe me. They want to believe in this intermittent fasting idea and some of these other things that are going on a lot, and we have to interfere with the belief system. So study of four groups of elite female athletes, rhythmic gymnasts, artistic gymnasts, middle distance, and long distance runners. Athletes who deviated from energy balance most throughout the day had higher body fat levels both when too many and too few calories were consumed. You can eat too many calories and end up with more fat mass and eat too few calories and end up with more fat mass because you don't eat periodically throughout the day. So we've always promoted, since I started my business 24 years ago, Elmo, eat less more often. And most people do that anyway. 
I will tell you that in my office, we get food journals from people. 95% of them involve eating more than just meals. Sometimes people will skip a meal, but they'll eat snacks in the middle of the afternoon, middle of the evening, mid-morning, whatever. So since they're doing it anyway, it's easier to make this transition with that eating, eating pattern. Other people seem very determined not to do that, but they would really be better off. And we're, we're trying to take the snackers and turn them into five to six meals a day of healthy food. We're trying to take the starvers and turn them into five or six meals of healthy food. Both, both people have solved their problem um, the same way. A comparison of boxers consuming equal calories in two meals versus six. Two meals per day resulted in loss of lean mass. Six meals a day, no loss of lean mass, and there was um, a, a decrease in markers for muscle breakdown. Study of 60 male and female college athletes who added 250 calorie snacks three times a day, total of 750 extra calories a day. After two weeks, they had a significant reduction in body fat, increase in lean mass, improvement in anaerobic power, aerobic endurance, no change in weight. What happened is when they started evening out their, cal their calorie intake at the very other eating times was reduced to compensate for the 250 calorie snacks. And so spreading the food throughout the day, same number of calories, increased their performance and increased their body or improved their body composition. They were told to resume their prior eating pattern and when they were evaluated four weeks later, they'd return to their baseline body composition. It doesn't take very long for the negative effects of fasting as an athlete uh, to, to set in. It also doesn't take very long for it to reverse as well. The benefits go beyond metabolism and body composition. People who eat more frequently have lower cholesterol, lower LDL cholesterol, lower insulin levels. There are even changes during Ramadan for Muslims who fast during the day. Insulin and leptin levels increase while fasting. Uh, both, associated with mo both of those things are associated with more fat storage. Um, female athletes, one of the biggest concerns, particularly as adolescents, is amenorrhea. And the amount of time spent every day in calorie deficit is a predictor of whether or not a an, an female athlete will develop amenorrhea. All right, so another timing issue, post-exercise carbohydrate intake. So there's an enzyme called glycogen synthase. And because the body is such a perfect machine, once you've done some aggressive exercise and you've depleted your glycogen stores, your glycogen synthase, synthase uh, um, levels go up, and your body's saying, we are ready to store glycogen, so please eat some carbohydrates so we can do that. So the best thing to do is to eat two to 400 calories of carbohydrate. It depends on what you've done. It might be 1,000 calories of carbohydrate if you've been running for five hours. But anyway, you want to re restore those glycogen stores as fast as you can, and the body really can't do it with protein and fat. So you want to eat carbohydrate. All right, let's talk about hydration for a minute because this is important too, and it's often neglected. So it's very important for athletes to remain hydrated. Um, tremendous amount of heat and water and sodium lost through uh, sweating um, when you're an athlete. Most athletes experience dehydration. They start activity dehydrated. Most people start just regular exercise sessions dehydrated. It's astounding to me the number of people who show up at our hot yoga classes for the first time in my office and they haven't had a glass of water since 1977. And it doesn't go well. It's not pretty because it's, I mean, you just have to have uh, water. Um, the consequences range from fatigue to life-threatening heat stroke, which we'll talk about. So 50% of the average person's weight is water. For males, it's 60%. Females, a little bit less. Um, athletes, 70%. And the reason is because they build those bigger muscles with more mitochondria, bigger, stored, stored, uh, bigger stores of glycogen, all stored with water. So athletes actually have, a well-hydrated athlete is about 70% water. Um, the blood is 93% water. Very important to remember. Um, water delivers oxygen and nutrients and hormones and all kinds of substances to cells. And water also, the, the blood also helps to um, uh, remove metabolic waste from the cells. So you gotta get blood, blood delivers all these things to the cells, takes the waste out of the cells. Water serves a protective function. It not only plumps up the blood plasma to its full level, but it cushions the spinal cord and the, and the head from injury and the brain, helps to regulate temperature. And water and electrolytes like sodium together, they're involved in something called osmotic pressure. It regulates the fluid inside and outside of the cells. 
The working muscles require more blood flow for delivery of nutrients and removal of waste if you're physically active. It's just like when you exercise more, you need more calories. When you exercise more, you need more blood flow. Everything you need more of if you're going to exercise and do it efficiently. Um, to increase sweat rate, the blood has to be moved from the muscle to the skin. If you have low blood volume, one of, or both of these systems can fail, and it results in reduced athletic performance. Um, so hydration is required for athletes to perform well. Now, physical activity, you have to dissipate heat, or the body would be too hot, you couldn't stand it anymore. The main method for heat dissipation is sweating. It cools down the body. And by the way, it isn't just sweating, it's the evaporation of sweat. So when I see people toweling off all the time, I tell them stop that because the actual sweating is not what cools the body, it is the, um, uh, the evaporation of sweat from the body. Well, if you're not hydrated, you don't sweat well, right? So you need to be hydrated. Um, athletes performing intense exercise in hot weather can lose two and a half liters of water per hour. And along with that water, they lose sodium and electrolytes, and all this stuff has to be replaced. If you don't replace the water and electrolytes from sweating, um, sweat production is lowered, the body can't cool itself, the core temperature goes up, and people can feel intolerably hot and not even be able to continue. And here's another thing. I mentioned that blood, blood plasma is 93% water. Here's what happens if you don't drink enough water. The blood plasma shrinks. In other words, you, 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 can't, there's not, you need that fluid to hold it up. The smaller the blood volume becomes, the more sticky and viscous it becomes. All right, so now you've got sticky, viscous blood trying to move through the vessels. And um, it, it can lead to increased risk of clotting and heart attacks and strokes. Um, some very good studies that have been done in Scandinavia have shown that in a dose-dependent manner, the more dehydrated a person is, the higher the risk of heart attack. The more hydrated the person is, the lower the risk of heart attack. And by the way, one of those studies, uh, the researchers reported, the reason why people have heart attacks first thing in the morning is not because they're too stressed to go to work. They have heart attacks in the morning because it is the most dehydrated part of the day. People go to bed hydrated, dehydrated, they don't drink water all night, and they get up and they're the most dehydrated. That is when the blood is the stickiest and the most viscous and when you're most likely to have a clot and have a heart attack. Okay, so hopefully everybody's understanding the importance of A, carbohydrate, B, resistance training and exercise, and C, water. Very, very, very important. Thirst is not a good indicator of your need for water. People, people say things like, well, if I, was, if I was dehydrated, I'd drink water. Now, I don't know if you guys have realized, but almost all of you have started drinking water just while I'm talking. I have a magical <laughs> effect on human behavior. It's just astounding, isn't it? But, but anyway, thirst is not a good indicator because, first of all, as we age, our thirst mechanism um, is reduced quite a bit. Um, and often we are very dehydrated by the time we're thirsty and it becomes even harder to get ourselves hydrated again. And probably the best story I can tell you that illustrates the point, I mean, we have a lot of science to show it too, but I have a very good friend, real successful businessman in Columbus. He was sitting in a boardroom in New York closing a very big deal and he just fell over on the floor. And they took him to the hospital, called the squad. Guess what his problem was? Dehydrated. Now, here's a guy who's a multimillionaire sitting at a conference table with water pitchers on the table. And I'm pretty sure if this smart guy had been thirsty, he would have reached for some of that water instead of passing out on the floor and ending up in the hospital. But he didn't. So thirst is not a good indicator. So for athletes and other people, you need to get in the habit of drinking water on a regular basis, whether you're thirsty or not. And, um, and if, you don't, if you allow yourself to become dehydrated, you only need about a 2% drop in your water levels for your performance to be impacted, not just your athletic performance, but your cognitive performance too. And by the way, many sports require a great deal of cognitive ability um, in addition to athletic ability. Um, athletes who start dehydrated can't return to a hydrated state during the competition or the practice. We see this again in the yoga studio. If you come into hot yoga dehydrated and you realize it, you can't start sucking on water. You'll, you'll get sick from too much water intake before you'll get hydrated by the end of the class. So we, we tell people when they come in, just sit down, watch the class if it's too much, and then you can join back in when you're ready and you'll learn from watching. And we have a very high percentage of people coming for the first time to sit down and watch. And the biggest issue is they're just not hydrated enough to tolerate the heat. So, um, you have to discipline yourself to drink water 
whether you're thirsty or not, on a regular schedule. <coughs> and heavily sweetened beverages are not a substitute, by the way. You just need water, just plain water. There are two things that can be absorbed directly through the stomach walls, water and alcohol. Don't recommend alcohol for athletic performance, but the water, really helpful, okay? Um, super hydration. Um, athletes sometimes do this, endurance athletes will. It's okay to a point, I don't recommend it on a regular basis, is drinking water until your urine is clear. And the advantage of doing it is that you, you build more endurance for, for a marathon or something of that nature. Um, frequent urination is a problem for athletes in this situation, but eating more sodium, uh, you know, eating foods that contain sodium can help to retain the water through the actual uh, performance. But I don't recommend doing this for regular people. People who tell me their urine is always clear probably means that they're super hydrating every day and that's really not a good idea. Oh, thank you. Talking about. Yeah, well, we're talking about water, yeah. I talk all day long, so for me, talking is an Olympic event every day. You know, that, that's my, uh, I, I also do the gym and hot yoga and all that kind of stuff, but, but I do talk a lot. Um, hyponatremia is a condition where, and this is, this is the dangerous thing about drinking too much water on a regular basis, whether you're an athlete or not. Hyponatremia is a very dangerous condition where you wash out your salt stores. And um, it can be fatal if, if it's not addressed. And some of the risk factors for hyponatremia, um, well, some of the symptoms, first of all, nausea, cramping, slurred speech, disorientation, general confusion can lead to coma or death. And some of the um, avoiding hyponatremia, um, headache and confusion, uh, nausea, cramping, bloated stomach, this comes from drinking way too much water. And I don't know if you know the story of the Boston Marathon runner who died of hyponatremia. Have anybody heard the story? This woman actually gained like three pounds while running the marathon. And, um, and that's how much water she drank. And I think she probably thought she was doing a good thing. But if you're putting on weight from water uh, intake while you're either training or competing, you're probably on your way to, um, uh, to having hyponatremia. I'm going to see if I could go backwards. Uh, no, I think I'm all right. So if you want to prevent hyper hyponatremia, um, make sure that you're eating enough salt. Athletes who, unless there's some medical condition that warrants salt restriction, athletes should not salt restrict. Actually, most people should not salt restrict because they don't need to, basically. Um, fluid intake after exercise. Post-exercise hydration is important because it prepares you to be able to go at it again. Uh, most athletes replace about 70% of what they lost in sweat. That's the average. Which means what? They start tomorrow's training dehydrated. And if they replace it at 70%, it's, an it's a downward spiral where people become increasingly dehydrated. Um, we see this, it influences everything. It influences your athletic performance, it influences your cognitive health, it influences your blood viscosity, there, there's not a single marker of health that isn't damaged uh, by allowing yourself to become dehydrated. So the bottom line, and then we can turn this into some questions, is that athletes perform better when they eat a high carbohydrate, low fat, low protein diet, just the opposite of what they're being told to do. They eat frequently throughout the day, much better eating pattern. They consume enough water and sodium uh, to remain hydrated and they train hard using clean fuel and water. There's just no way around it. You're not gonna build, you're not gonna eat your way to a strong body without exercise um, and the right training program. Um, one thing I'll, I'll just mention, this, I first got interested in this topic when I met Brendan Brazier, who's a vegan athlete, one of the first ones who wrote a book on the topic, and um, his story was compelling because he said he had this big awakening in college. He wanted to be a professional triathlete and he had a college scholarship and was preparing to do it, and he actually did that. He said he started thinking about the fact that he's from, Can from Canada. If you go to college in Canada to be a triathlete, the training program for triathletes doesn't vary much between colleges. So why is it that some athletes do so much better than others? In other words, if everybody's getting some version of the same training program, what's up? And of course, some of it is there's a little bit of genetic gifting in, in athletic performance. Um, size can have something to do with it. I couldn't play in the NFL at 119 pounds or whatever I weigh right now. But, but the other thing is the fuel. He decided then in college that it had to be a difference in fuel. 
And he started looking into it, tried a bunch of things, just he was like an N of one, trying things on himself, and he finally ended up eating a plant-based diet. And he, and he said it was like the aha moment. He gave this talk at our conference in Columbus, I remember it really well. He said it was like the big aha moment because he realized that this is the, the holy grail. This is the holy grail that all these people have been looking for, we've been talking about. He says a, an athlete who eats a plant-based diet can train one extra time a day. And the extra training, because of the fast recovery, is the thing that makes you better. It's the diff it can make the difference between performance and non-performance. There was a football player, and I can't remember his name, right? it might be Tony Gonzalez, who converted to a plant-based diet when he was the oldest player in the football league, in the NFL. And he wrote articles about this, that people half his age were laying around for two days after the football game, and he was in the weight room the next day because the recovery was so fast on a plant-based diet. So it's unfortunate, but athletes are told to do the opposite of everything that we've been talking about here. And uh, they don't get to see, well, it's back to informed decision-making. Athletes should be making decisions about their diet the same way that we've been talking about making decisions about everything. Look at evidence and then choose what's best, and instead they're just letting coaches and uh, sports experts tell them what to do. So uh, I want to take some time for questions, but first of all, I do want to say um, Steve Shore rocks for putting this on. We should give him a big hand. This conference, this conference is a beast to organize, and it makes me have hives thinking about all the moving parts with people being interviewed. And have you noticed it all goes well? And Steve doesn't ever look stressed, which is astounding to me. So either he's the most organized person on the planet, or I want the drugs he's taking, either one. I think it's because he's so organized and he has such a great team. But really, thank you, because you make it very easy for people like me to come and be part of this. It's a very stressless um, thing for me, too. So I'm happy to take some questions. Good, I'm glad we have a lot of them. So I'll repeat the question for the, for the taping here. Yes. Oh, they want a microphone. Good idea. Then I won't have to repeat. And I'll let you just wander around and pick people. Thank you. Um, thanks for very interesting. Um, so my question is, you said that when people um, kind of condense their meals to twice a day, then they have starvation periods. And um, I'm wondering if, I understand that thirst is not a good indicator for dehydration, but is hunger a good indicator for starvation? So if, for example, not always. When you fast, you'll hear about this later. When you fast, you'll be hungry for a little while, and then you won't be hungry at all, even though you're not eating at all. People who don't eat breakfast, they don't, if they don't eat breakfast long enough, they don't wake up hungry. And, so, um, and that's one of the reasons why they end up gaining weight, a lot of them, because their hunger signals aren't working so well anymore. As soon as they start eating breakfast, they'll start waking up hungry within a few days. So... Um, on that note, so I'm kind of horrified to eat before I work out because it, it does well, feel terrible. So yeah. should I make myself eat something small three hours before? Because well, I just don't if, eat. If, you can, if you're a high burn, you should be able to eat full breakfast three hours before and burn it up before you show up to work out. Okay. Well, we can talk <laughs> about that because I do. I mean, I eat, a, I eat big meals and I have a big meal and then three or four hours later I'm in the gym or yoga or whatever I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll just pick somebody. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so how much exercise is, is recommended if, like, you don't want to be an athlete, you just want to be an active, everyday person, and like you said, grow healthy and, and stay healthy and grow old? Um, I've heard everything from, oh, 10 minutes a day to an hour a day. I mean, I have a day job. Yeah. So well, like, the, what everybody do you really likes, do? Everybody <laughs> likes 10 minutes a day because people like to hear good news about their bad habits, right? So well, I like that 10, 10 minute a day plan. Actually, you need to do about 45 to 60 minutes, five or six days a week. And, um, and you need some strength training, a couple strength training sessions, and some aerobic activity, and maybe some stretching, and that sort of thing, too. So something every day? Yeah, not every day. I mean, you can, it depends. Like, if you do, yeah, sometimes, for example, I'll go through, my, my life is a little nutty sometimes because of the type of work I do, so I'll take two yoga classes on Thursday night in a row because I can just do it and I have the time. And then I might not do something on Friday because... Three hours in the hot room is a lot, you know? Uh, or I'll go out on a Saturday, for example, and run 10 miles because I can. 
and then I might not do something the next day. So but you should have one day, maybe two days of rest, depending on, um, on, on what you're doing. But most people would like to think that you don't have to exercise and there's always somebody out there telling you you don't have to do it and you can do less. And people love to hear that, it's just not the truth. Thank you so much for your presentation, Pam, very informative. Um, I'm sure everyone has this question, um, what is the best water to drink? There's so many options out there. There's alkaline water, there's tap water, there's all yeah. these different waters for drinking out of plastic, not drinking out of plastic. Yeah. So maybe you could discuss what you choose to do and what you think the best is and what's the worst and yeah. how the dangers of fluoride and chlorine. Yeah, so we could talk about that for a long time, but I'll give you the short version. The first thing is that there's no problem drinking water in plastic. This is, this, the, the assertion that there is, is based on interpreting correlation to be causation, and, and they're not the same thing. In other words, if this is happening at the same time as this, then this must have caused this. Well, let me give you an example of how that would work. In countries where more women are getting driver's licenses, the breast cancer rate is going up. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't let women drive, okay? Well, if you do some research, why is this happening? It's happening because that's a, a, you know, more women driving is a sign of westernization, which brings with it a diet. Okay, so it would be ridiculous to take away driving, driver's licenses from women. So you have to be very careful that you're not hypothesizing and using correlation to arrive at a conclusion because it's very inappropriate in science. Second thing is, it, the, the best thing probably is a carbon filter. It's what I have in my house. It takes out the chemicals and that sort of thing from the water. It does not take out the minerals, which is important. And it also doesn't take out the fluoride. But I have been seeing sick people for 24 years, and I have never seen a person, nor have any of my colleagues. And you, you read medical journals, and you won't find even case reports of people who have been sickened by fluoride in drinking water. Now, I'm opposed to it, for the record, just so you know. I'm opposed to a lot of things, but I have to separate my opposition to it from what is scientifically provable, all right? So, and, and, and we have a lot of people spending time on things that, for which we don't have any proof, and it's sometimes at the expense. It's a distraction from things that are really important, right? So I, I wouldn't worry so much about the fluoride. Um, if we could make a magic wand and have the municipalities stop doing it, that would be good, but that's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, the problem with water that is demineralized and, um, and, and, and pure H2O, reverse osmosis distillation, humans have been drinking water since the beginning of our time on Earth and they have never consumed pure H2O, ever. We were drinking from the rivers and streams, full of minerals and other substances. Now, I don't recommend drinking from rivers and streams. I don't do that myself. But the answer to the problem is not to drink pure H2O because it has a high acid load. So some of the same people who are recommending Reverse osmosis and distillation are quick to tell you you shouldn't eat animal foods because of the high acid load. You can do this yourself. A chemistry teacher disagreed with me. I said, take the water from, from one of these bottles to the lab and see what the pH is. Read the instructions on dental equipment. If you run this water through dental equipment, the warranty is over, okay, because it corrodes the inside of the dental equipment. So all this to say, I think filtered tap water is the, is the most economical answer. And if you're not going to buy that, then buy bottled water that actually has minerals in it. Not fortified with minerals, but naturally occurring minerals. Um, I'm right over here. Where um, are you? Were, were you ah, really? okay. <laughs> so you, you said that no one should be sodium deprived. Nobody should what? Be sodium deprived. You were talking about the athletes, but then you said no one should be sodium deprived. Yeah, the evidence for salt restriction is, is falling apart at such a rapid rate, <laughs> you can't believe it. What happened was, I'll tell you the background on the sodium issue. When the DASH study was done, the DASH researchers said sodium restriction lowers blood pressure. So go back and read the DASH study. And this is, this is informed decision making. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Go back and read it. These people were eating less animal food, more fruits, vegetables, and grains. They were exercising, lower fat. They, they were doing 20 things. You cannot take that study and say, this shows salt restriction leads to lower blood pressure. Um, nonetheless, the whole world started telling people, you got to keep your salt intake under 2 grams a day, 2,000 milligrams a day. Everybody went down that path. It hasn't worked out well. First of all, it's the worst compliance with a public health policy in the history of the universe because it's failed everywhere it's ever been done. And one of the reasons is we have salt receptors, taste buds on our tongues. 
Humans crave salt. They'll lick it off the walls of caves if you deprive, it of, deprive them of it long enough. I started looking into this myself and actually reading the medical literature because I made the mistake early in my career of parroting what other people say. I, tra I train a lot of health professionals in our school. And I, one of the first things I tell them is you've got to get to the place where you stop parroting what other people say because I told people wrong things in the beginning of my career by doing that. So when I started reading the medical literature, it actually says in many studies that salt restriction causes the problems that it's supposed to solve. In other words, you have this median amount of salt intake that's safe for humans and been typical of humans. If you eat more than that, it's bad. I mean, an unlimited not amount of salt is not what I'm talking about at all. If you eat too much, it's bad. You, you start eating 10,000 milligrams of salt and sodium in, in cheese and processed foods, that, you're gonna get sick. But the other side of it is if you start restricting down to a couple thousand milligrams, you're gonna get the same diseases that you get at this extreme over here. And the medical literature is quite clear on this. I mean, I can show you studies that say at the bottom, conclusion, salt restriction causes increases in insulin levels. Salt restriction causes increases in systolic blood pressure at a certain level. So, so, and plus it just makes everything harder to do. And I was really pleased to see a cardiologist, um, I, I wrote a story about this um, and I'm doing a video clip on it next week. Um, a cardiologist wrote a, a, an article about this and said, we have so much trouble getting people to do the right things. We cannot invest energy in things that don't really help because they become a distraction like the plastic bottles to things that would really help. So while you're busy salt restricting, and I can't get you to eat the vegetables because they don't taste good, you know? So that's, that's what I was talking about. So, so one last question on that then, because I've been able to control my blood and pressure. And I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't think that mic is live. Yeah. Uh, ah, good. So, so what I wanted to ask or add to that is I've, I've been able to control my blood pressure after 30 years without meds by reducing well, that, no. you might be a person who's salt restrictive. That's like saying, and here, this is where we get to, and I've spoken about this at this conference before. We have got to start exercising clinical judgment, all right? And, and there's a, there, we understand that lack of clinical judgment in a traditional medical setting is a bad idea. Everybody who has high cholesterol gets statin drugs, and everybody who has this gets that, and everybody has this procedure and this test. Okay, we can be guilty of the same thing, just in a different model. And so my point is this, people who are sensitive to salt should not eat it. Alcoholics should not drink alcohol, okay? People who have celiac disease should not have gluten. But all of a sudden we get these recommendations, nobody should eat any gluten and nobody should have any salt and everybody should never have alcohol. If people who are sensitive to caffeine shouldn't drink coffee. But that doesn't mean everybody shouldn't drink coffee. So, so the key is figuring out what is really necessary for people. And, I, and my personal feeling, and I, I speak about this a lot, we're trying to get long-term compliance. Our interaction with our, the people that we help is over the long term. They're members this year and next year and the next year and 10 years later. People are still members from when this business was in my house 23, 24 years ago, all right? So we have an opportunity to see what happens to them over the long term. And what we're trying to do is the long term, because two weeks of good eating does not health make, okay? We gotta get 25 years of good eating. And that's a whole different animal than getting people all geeked up about something. You know, I've, this is a newsflash. I have a strong personality. I know none of you would have picked up on that if I didn't tell you. <laughs> but, but here's the danger in having a strong personality in this business, is that you can get people to agree to a lot of things by the enthusiasm you have and the force of your personality. So we used to, we call it nutritional nonsense. We used to extract all these promises from people. I'll never eat salt, I'll never have coffee, I will never eat white flour, I'll never have another cookie again. What do you think is the likelihood people 35 years old are gonna keep those promises? Zero, you guessed it, zero. So let's not spend our time on that, let's spend our time on the big issues. Eat plants, don't eat animals, get rid of the dairy, stop eating so much processed food, learn to batch cook. You know, let's, let's eat meals instead of snacks and that sort of thing. Really, really important. So the mic controls it. So just so you guys know, um, after, after we're done here, we'll get as many questions as we can until they make me leave the stage. And then I'm gonna go over someplace and uh, where am I gonna be? Right here, okay. And, uh, and I'll sign books and I brought the things so you can sign up for a newsletter and video clips and I brought some forms about you can take this class, the long version and all that sort of thing. So we'll have lots of time to talk and I will not leave until I answer all your questions. We'll just do as many as we can right now. Okay, so who's next? Hi Pam, how are you? Hi. Thank great. you for your, thanks for your presentation, it was great. 
I just wanted to ask you, I know you recommend a high carbohydrate diet, but uh, a what? A high carb diet. Yeah. Yes. What about the segment of, of the population, I don't know if it's 10% or 50%, who don't metabolize carbohydrates well? There are, aren't 10 or 15% who don't metabolize carbohydrates well. That's not true. So, well, yeah, let, me, let me just tell you what the rules are for engaging with me on that issue. Please bring me studies. We'll look at them together. Well, I know personally I test, I have a glucometer and I test myself and... Well, but you're an N of one. Okay, so, so let, let's just say for the moment you're, you're right. And, and let's just, for our argument's sake. Okay, that doesn't mean, it's like the person who comes to my Barnes & Noble talk when I have a book come out and says, my uncle ate bacon, eggs, and cheese three times a day, he lived to be 94 and died in his sleep. I believe you, but the science is very clear that most people are not gonna have that same experience. So this is, this is, I'm not discounting your experience, and we could have an interesting conversation about this sometime, not here. But, but the point is that when people act on stories, and there's so much storytelling going on in this business, they're almost always gonna be led astray because an individual's personal experience, A, may not have anything to do with the general population, and B, this, this may be another error of attribution. I don't know. We could figure that out when we talk. But the point is it's very, very important to look at research when you're making these decisions. And there aren't any populations that don't process uh, carbohydrate properly. It's the fuel of the body. It is the preferred fuel of the body. Humans have been living on carbohydrates for carbohydrate fuel for a long, 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 long time. Okay. Whoever has the mic gets it next. Pam? Yes. Um. You were talking about one and a half grams per kilogram of weight as the optimal protein amount, whatever, however that was arrived at. But I looked recently at the numbers. What if I get all my calories for the day from meat, or what if I get it all from uh, uh, spinach, or what if I get it all from rice? And there's a dramatic difference in terms of uh, protein. If I get it all from rice, I probably, if I'm small enough, which I'm not, but some people are in here, I'm probably getting too much protein. So almost every category of carbohydrate has a certain amount of protein associated with it that seems to be generally too much, especially if it's spinach or green vegetables, which are... Well, but you're assuming that you could eat 2,000 or 3,000 calories worth of spinach, which you can't. No, so I'm using so it as a test to see what happens if I take it in the extreme. So well, if I take... But, but let's, let's not talk about doing crazy things. I'm going to see if I can eat spinach for seven years and not How that. How about so, pasta? So, well, but let's, let's just, let's, let's use something useful. Okay. How about we just eat a wide variety of foods that you like that fit in with this eating pattern and let's pick 25 of them, any 25 you want that are, that are within our food pyramid where that, that fit. And I will guarantee if we run them through a nu nutrition calculator, they'll come out fine. Okay, so, so the, the, what happens is, and I'm glad you asked this question because it's a great thing to talk about. People get into the nutritional weeds. It's where they're hypothesizing and trying to use reductionism and, and, they, and they can't get there from here. Okay, so rice has 8% of calories from protein. So you're, you, you, you'll, you'll be fine if you live on rice, but I don't think you should do that and you're not gonna do it. So let's not worry about doing it. Instead, let's look at a dietary pattern that fits, this, that fits the pattern of healthy people, comprised of any foods you want to eat. There are no magical foods. So, and, I, and I learned that a long time ago, by the way, because I used to think that there were magical foods. And I'll never forget one of my conversations with one of my early clients. And I said, how's it going? She goes, it's fine. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I'm eating kale. I'm eating green apples. I said, it doesn't sound like you like those foods. She said, I hate those foods. I said, then why are you eating them? She says, because everybody says they're so good for you. I said, I have a better idea. Eat any kind of apple you want. Eat any kind of green thing that you want. I just want you to eat those things. And it works out just fine. You know? so, so I think the key is, you're not, if, you, if you look at eating like a normal human, variety right. of foods that you like, and you're eating animal foods two to three times a week or less, less is better. You're not eating dairy, processed foods at the top of the pyramid, living on starch. You are not going to eat too much protein, and you're not going to be protein deficient. The real question I had was that there was one study showing that high protein diet versus low protein diet, but obviously the low protein diet performed much better, but the difference between the low and the high protein 
was about 90% animal-based protein. Right. So I'm wondering if you think that plant-based protein is maybe an exception. No, it's not because it'll blow out your kidneys the same way. When you, okay. break, down, when you break down the excess amino acids that, that have to go somewhere, they're all going to release nitrogen, whether they come from spinach or whether they come from beef. Got it. And so you, you have the same risk of kidney, kidney problems. Yeah. Plus, you're, you're displacing carbohydrate in the diet, regardless of which food you're choosing to do it. Good questions. Thank you. Okay, I have a question on um, meal timing and intermittent fasting. Yes. Um, with meal timing, um, when it comes to after doing some type of um, uh, strength training exercises, how important is it to eat a carbohydrate, high carbohydrate protein meal after you participate in, say, about an hour or so of um, strength training? It, it's not so important. Um, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it lets me clarify something. So if you run a marathon, or you do a half marathon or some type of, you know, more, not your daily workout kind of thing. You're gonna use up your ready glucose, you're gonna use up your glycogen stores and your body is saying, we gotta replace those glycogen stores and you need carbohydrate. You're not going to deplete yourself enough in a 45 minute strength training workout or an hour, for example, to deplete everything. So the next thing you eat should be carbohydrate, but for a different reason. It's because it's the fuel of the body. It's like the gas tank. When you're, when you're on empty, whether it's right after the workout or an hour later, you want to fill the tank with gas. Okay? Good question. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. shit. Um, I want to know if you have any knowledge on what causes onset food allergies, like things that have happened over the last five years into your body that makes you allergic to, say, chocolate. Mm -hmm. And that's so terrible, being yeah, allergic to chocolate. it's the worst thing ever. It makes me want to cry just thinking about it. But, um, there, is, there is an increasing incidence of allergies, period. Food, environmental, you know, the whole thing. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for it. I think one is um, damage to the gut microbiome, which is partially responsible for immune function. So when your immune system is misbehaving, it's interested in food and pollen and sometimes in your own tissues, autoimmune. Um, that's the source of it. And of course, the overuse of antibiotics is a big factor. Um, the overuse of NSAIDs, they don't damage your microbiome as quickly as um, as antibiotics, but they do damage. So do oral contraceptives, steroid drugs. Um, a lot of our eating patterns do too. So I think that's part of it. Um, I also think that there, and this is depending on where you are, I think I'm safe to talk about this here. I think vaccinations have screwed up our immune systems. Um, I, I've read some interesting articles uh, about this issue, and it's you don't hear much about these types of studies, but in the medical literature, there are some studies that have said quite clearly, it could be, and the, the authors are always very quick to couch it, that in spite of all the benefits of the current vaccination program, that it's causing this issue of, of uh, increased allergy and autoimmune. So I think that's part of it. Um, <coughs> some of it, we just don't know why people develop an allergy to something. Uh, a lot of studies have been done on, gosh, if mom eats too much of this food, is that, you know, does that cause it? The time of the introduction of the food, for example, there was some research that was done exploring the hypothesis that a reason why we're seeing um, potentially more gluten allergy is because kids are getting gluten earlier in their diet, could not find any answer. So I think there's still a lot we don't know about why people are developing allergies to food. One last thing I'll mention is a lot of people who come to us thinking that they have allergies to food really don't. I would say probably 20% of the people coming to us have been told they have something that either doesn't exist or they don't have it. Made up diseases and, and uh, or they don't actually have food allergies. That's a, that's a possibility too. There's a great book about allergies called Another Person's Poison by Matthew Smith. Uh, we used it in our advanced study. One of the things that my clients get to do is we do advanced study every month where I pick a book that I think they should read and I know they're not gonna. And we have workshops and slide sets and we talk about the books. And, and that one was very uh, well attended because it's a topic a lot of people want to know about. 
Thank you. This is uh, fascinating. So I want to talk to you a little bit about telomeres. And you were talking about fasting. We know that uh, fasting lengthens the telomeres. And so we all want long telomeres. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Well, I'm all for fasting. I probably sent 500 people to Alan Goldhammer's place, True North. Uh, they, they should name a building after me. They've threatened to do that, actually. I don't think there's a time in any year in the last 15 years I haven't had a member there. So I'm all for it. Um, and I think that fasting does, it's, I've always explained it to people, it's like rebooting your computer, um, resetting your computer. And it's been known as a means of improving health for since biblical times, people have been doing it. So I'm all for fasting. What I'm taking issue with is this increasingly um, popular intermittent fasting practice, which I, the research shows that it's generally more counterproductive than productive. Um, I just did a, a, a um, video clip last week, I don't know how many of you saw it on autophagy, and the 25 other ways to induce autophagy besides intermittent fasting, because that's the way it's being promoted. Your body simply can't clean house unless you starve 16 hours a day, um, which is not true, which is not true. Um, my objection to it is more um, than anything, this compliance issue, okay? And, and, and here are the reasons why people aren't compliant. Too hard to do, that's one thing. Resistance from other people. And I'll tell you what increases the resistance from other people is when the people around you think that you joined some strange cult over the weekend and you need to be kidnapped and deprogrammed and get away from these people. And so, I mean, I just, I think about the accountant who's 45 years old, who picks up intermittent fasting and Friday night's his mother's birthday party and he sits there drinking water and he refuses to eat or have a piece of cake. That doesn't go on for very long before people are back to their old habits. You know what I'm saying? This is just, I, I really can't overemphasize how important I think it is to make what we're teaching people to do fit in with their life. Because if we can't do that, we are not going to win this, people. We're just not going to win this. We're going to be a small sect of people who do bizarre stuff because we support each other in the bizarreness. And we will never get the, po the general population in. So that's where a lot of my comments come from is, first of all, the science and what it says and doesn't say, but, but also, is the practice sustainable? Can we teach somebody to do it in 25 years from now? They're still going to be saying, you know what? Starvation 16 hours a day is great. I mean, after 25 years, I can tell you it's the best thing ever. And watching people eat at social gatherings rocks my world. I just don't see that happening. So... While we're at intermittent fasting, um, I personally like the idea and um, a lot of my family, they're doing it and they are quite happy with it, and, but they make exceptions when they have, you know, Friday nights or they're somewhere else, so they probably do it four or five days a week and the rest they just yeah. have fun. Yeah, well, like, like I said, I'm not in the business of talking people out of things. When I, when I have the stage, I'm in the business of promoting things that I think will work for most people in the long term, okay? And, and truth be known, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll use myself as an example. If I were to tell you the way that I eat and live, it's all healthy, but it's not what I would recommend to most people for a couple of reasons, all right? And, and, and the way I eat and live is I eat a pretty pristine diet with an enormous amount of produce every day and the whole nine yards, and, and I go to the farmer's market, and I, I mean, people ask me if I'm a caterer. I say, no, I'm, I'm gonna eat all this food myself, you know. <laughs> go, wow, look like kind of a little person for all that. I know, but not really calorie dense. And so I eat a ton of food, and, I'm, and I work out for stress relief, sometimes between, in the middle of an 18 hour day, there's nothing like 90 minutes of hot yoga to get your mind focused again. People say, you're crazy. They might be right, but here's my point. These are personal choices that I've, I've made I can afford to make them. I have the control of my time to make them. And so my personal lifestyle, which is consistent with what I teach, it's health promoting. I, I walk the talk so that I'm in integrity with what I have to say. But, but it would be a bad idea for me to start telling people, you know what you need to do? You need to take like a cart and go to the farmer's market and buy all the food. And that, because seriously, most people aren't gonna do it, you know? 
So that's, that's why I think it's important to put things in context. So I'm not trying to argue with anybody here as much as I am trying to make sure that the message goes out to the tens of thousands or millions of people who watch it and they say, I can do that. All right, I can do it and I want to do it. Okay, my question is if people follow a plant-based diet, do they still need to take supplements? If people what? Follow a plant-based diet, do they still need supplements? Would there still be supplements? Um, I think people who eat a vegan diet with no processed foods that are fortified should take a B12 supplement. I think that a good argument can be made for a probiotic uh, for many people because of damage to the microbiome with antibiotics and antibiotic-laden food, that sort of thing. I think when it comes to the rest of it, the way that you decide about supplements is the same way you decide about drugs and surgery and everything else. You're going to look at the risks you're going to take and the benefits you're going to get and see if the benefit is worth the risk or if the, if the risk is even known. And the thing to be careful about when you're talking about supplements is sometimes it's the risks have never been studied. So you have to ask yourself, how comfortable am, am I taking something if I don't even know what the potential problems might be? And so it's an individual decision. Again, I try to steer people away from the one size fits all. Here are the 12 supplements I have all my people take. I think that's a terrible idea, all right? So the answer is not yes or no. It's back to that clinical judgment that I think we have to restore to healthcare practice. Whoever it was that started saying we want to systematize all of healthcare so that we treat everybody the same no matter what. I think that's the worst idea that ever happened in healthcare. And it takes time to talk to people and get to know them and find out what's going on with them and help them understand enough so that they can make the decision. Because ultimately the consumer should make the decision, going back to what I said earlier, you know. Um, so that's probably not the answer you were looking for. It'd be better to give you a yes or no, right? <laughs> it's so much cleaner. Uh, not necessarily the right thing to do. We're done? Yeah, so I have to stop now because they said so. But I'm going to come right over here, and I will stay and answer your questions, and um, would love to talk to you more. Thank you so much.